Herzlich willkommen zum AWS Summit 2013 in Berlin. Ich freue mich, Sie, Sie hier alle zu sehen, euch hier alle zu sehen. Um, despite the fact that uh, German football teams have a temporary lead in Europe at this point in time, <laughs> I am aware to the fact that not everybody here, everybody of our guests speaks German. That's why I will talk to you in English. I hope uh, you uh, understand. Um, For this day, we have set uh, a few objectives together with yourself. Uh, we want to help you getting informed, we want to inspire you, and uh, we want to set a platform for you to collaborate. And everything we do today, we want to set uh, in this context. Now, uh, for that, we have proposed the following agenda to you. This morning, we will be here uh, in this room, um, having two keynotes. One from Werner Vogels, who is the CTO to Amazon.com. And uh, the other one is Steven Schmidt, who is the Chief Information and Security Officer of AWS. After that, uh, we'll have a break. And uh, then we will break out into four meeting rooms, four breakout rooms, where we will have specifically customers talking to you about what they do with AWS for you to get informed and learn. Then we will gather here again for closing statements before we then have a um, networking reception. You may have noticed outside we have set uh, a little exhibition, both from our partners and sponsors and uh, colleagues of mine of AWS. Um, and especially I want to thank the sponsors who helped us building this event today, which is Intel Infopark, SUSE, and NetApp. And we want to offer you to get collaborative uh, with uh, our colleagues and our sponsors. Now, let me ask you a question about who of you in the audience still remembers what a phone booth is? <laughs> Anybody? Okay, some of them. Some of you must be really young. <laughs> Now, when we first saw this building here and walked in, on the ground floor, we saw these 10 phone booths on this side of the building, and we were scratching our heads saying, what are we going to do with these phone booths? Probably you won't use it. What we use this for is we have set uh, electronic um, feedback gadgets in there, and we would like to ask you if you want to use them to give us feedback about this event, about your needs. We have prepared them for you, so please come see them. It will be one of the rare occasions to still interact with this wonderful piece of technology of the past. Another aspect I want you to make aware of is if you came here with a project idea in mind, or if you have a specific project already that would not talk to about us, but you're not sure how to set it on the AWS platform in the right way, what we are offering you is 10 architecture reviews. An architecture review is a day of one of our specialists spending with you to make sure you're able to set your idea, your project on the AWS platform in the most sophisticated and right way. So if you're interested, sign up for this. Um, I think there are links and QR cards in the, in the handouts you find in your, on your place. And let us know what you have in mind. For the 10 most interesting ideas, we'll spend a day with you working with you on your project at no cost. If you want to use the usual channels to give us feedback, here they are. And now, with much further ado, I was talking about inspiration, and I cannot think of a better person of inspiring about today's technology on AWS, but also the future of AWS. So please help me welcoming Dr. Werner Vogels. Anna. Welcome. Morgen Berlin, wie geht's es Ihnen? Okay, thanks. Uh, it's actually quite a privilege to be here. So this used to be the place where the Cars Computer Club came together always. So it's, it's quite a bit of history here. Yeah, amazing. Uh, probably I should first Are there any Bayern and Dortmund fans in the hall here? 
Congratulations, guys. This is quite a feat. Yeah, I think you can, uh, whether or not you're, uh, whether you had to be at safe end or not, you, you can be proud of actually what, uh, what happened last night. So uh, amazing. Um, that's, so my talk is actually sort of more the glue between uh, a number of our customers who are coming on stage to talk. Um, uh, they're quite amazing. There are um, some younger companies and there are some really established 100-year-old companies that will be talking about how they are using cloud computing uh, to, to change and to transform their business. So my talk is going to sort of going to be in three different pieces, sort of a little bit of state, where are we with AWS, um, then talk a bit about bigger economic patterns and how cloud computing plays into that, and then sort of looking at uh, how is AWS or cloud computing in general sort of transforming complete industries. And um, in between there, these customers will be giving examples of, of how, how their business is being transformed by AWS. First of all, this is, uh, this is pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah? Remember, this is a business that is six years old, seven years old. And we, we now have um, 14 different summits around the world and 20,000 people have registered for it. Um, I, I'm really humbled by that. Um, I actually have an announcement to make, yeah, especially here uh, about Germany. We are uh, uh, expanding our, our, our business here in Germany by opening a um, development center in Germany. So if you're looking for a job, <laughs> <laughs> you're obviously interested in AWS. <laughs> so this development center, um, We'll have offices here in Berlin, uh, as well as in Dresden, and um, uh, it will be mainly focused around cloud computing technologies. Uh, so if you're interested in hypervisors, so all the way from low-level stuff to really building large-scale distributed systems. Um, we'll have lots of interesting jobs for you. Uh, as well as there, there will be a, a particular group focused on machine learning technologies. So if you're into that, um, please contact one of us after this. <laughs> So now uh, back to AWS. So I mentioned seven years. Um, in March of 2006, we launched Amazon S3, um, the uh, simple storage service. And since then, we've launched 33 other major services. Yeah, and so not only the building blocks, like the low-level building blocks, like computer storage and things like that, but also higher-level services. Uh, know, whether it's, it's database management or whether it's actually email or search, all of these different pieces, every time we've been really closely looking at where your pain points were and then try to solve those pain points. Uh, and for example, things that we launched last year, like Glacier, the archiving service, or Redshift, the, the large-scale um, data analytics service, um, both of them are really focused on solving things that, that are really hard in an enterprise or in a young business, um, so that you can focus on your customers instead of having to focus on doing technologies that doesn't differentiate you. Now, we've been relatively successful, I think. Hundreds of thousands of businesses, 190 countries, uh, and not actually only other countries. Yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> We do other planets as well. Uh, this is uh, the Curiosity rover from, from NASA. NASA JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab, is a, is a large customer of ours. And so all the data, so you've got two satellites that are actually circling around Mars that are the uplinks for the rover. And all data that comes off the rover immediately gets stored into Amazon S3, so it's available for many different researchers to collaborate on. Well, one of, if, if I look at things that set, uh, sets AWS aside from other, other technology providers, I think first and foremost is that we are focused on not locking you into any technology. I remember all these services are, are simply accessed by HTTP and XML. Um, you know, there is no libraries to link into. There is no, if you really want to be independent from any programming language or any piece of middleware, yeah, that's where we've really focused on. But also that you can actually run any technology that, that you want. And you know, big names from, of course, from Germany, like SAP and Software AG, 
uh, are uh, clearly our partners here. Uh, but you know, if you want to run, if you want to run Oracle's micro, uh, Linux system, or if you want Microsoft Server, if you want to run Exchange, if you want to run SharePoint, all of these technologies are available on our platform. And, and of course, there's, there's quite a few of our partners here as well. Uh, here, there's of course the larger names that you will find back across the world, but also uh, companies like, like TechRacer and ITM uh, from here in, in, in Germany are great partners in helping consulting uh, to companies, helping them get onto AWS. And again, technology-wise, um, we're very fortunate to have a very large collection of, of ISVs making their software available on our platform. Um, some of them are being made available through what's called the, the AWS Marketplace. Uh, and what we've tried to do with the AWS Marketplace is actually give you a sort of Amazon.com, or in this case, Amazon.de uh, experience in, in buying software, or in at least you know, buying software by the hour. And so this, this gives you a, uh, a marketplace where you, which you can search through, it gives you reviews, and it gives you the ability, just like with Amazon.com, with a one click to actually buy the software. So what you do, you select the region where you want to launch it, you select, select an availability zone, and, and if you want to, for example, start experimenting with SAP HANA, the in-memory database, you just go into the, uh, to the AWS marketplace, select that particular product, push one button, you've got an instance of that, uh, of that software. The second thing that sets AWS aside is a relentless focus on price reductions. Yeah, we're a very strong believer that we should be able to, if you help us yeah, to achieve economies of scale, and if we are able to actually, with all sorts of innovation, able to actually become more cost effective, then we should reduce pricing. Yeah, for us, this is a high volume, low margin business. And we're very, very comfortable with that. So we believe that we should let you share in, um, in any additional economies of scale or cost savings that we have. And of course, you know, there's a, there's a very large ecosystem. We have, a, we have now nine, nine regions around the world and continuously we roll, we roll out new features. So whenever we get these economies of scale, yeah, that's, that's run to, that increases AWS usage, that allows us to become more cost effective. And as soon as we become more cost effective, we'll drop pricing. Now we've done that 32 times. And if you look at the last year, uh, beginning of last year, for example, we reduced storage costs. We dropped costs to by about 40% last year for some of our customers. And, and in compute, we reduced cost by about 30, 35%, I think, uh, for on demand. And even if you use uh, reserved instances, we would drop it more. Um, so for us, this is, a, this is pure principle. Yeah? I really would like to see us drive the cost down much further to a point where you no longer have to think about cost. Yeah, if you, when you woke up this morning and you switched on the light in your room, you didn't think about how much that costed you. Yeah, so imagine that we can drive the cost down to a point where you know, cost is no longer a factor. It would mean that we would drive so much innovation, that so much new products are being built, that you know, the innovation of that is just incredible. And those things, they're just around the corner. Uh, and you know, one of the things that our customers are often surprised about is that we will work with you to actually reduce your bill with AWS. Now, often we have, we have solution architects and we have account managers and people like that that will work with you individually to drive this down, but we also have automated tools. In this case, um, you see here a screenshot of what's called AWS Trusted Advisor. It's part of our support package. Um, and if you actually allow that, to review your architecture or the way that AWS is being used, you get all sorts of advice about you know, uh, reliability, about security, but also about cost. Yeah, and so um, we, we gave well over 300,000 recommendations since we launched this one um, and helped our customers save about $22 million in, in costs. So we're more than happy to make sure that your bill is the lowest bill possible with AWS because we believe that if we can help you save money, you'll be a longer term customer with us. Plus that we are strong believers in making sure that you are in charge. 
Now, I know that the traditional, the traditional IT landscape vendors are the ones that are in charge. They basically determine price, they basically determine all these long-term contracts that you have to lock into to be able to drive your cost down. But in our case, we really want to turn this around. Yeah, where where Amazon.com prouds itself on being the Earth's most customer-centric company, we want to apply the same rules to the cloud computing business, meaning that you should be in control. If we are not doing our job, you should be allowed to walk away. And there's nothing like in your contracts that we lock you in for a very long period of time or anything like that. You should be in control. If we're not doing our best, then you should be able to vote with your feet. Now, I like to believe that you know, with, with not locking you in, with uh, te technology driving the, the cost down, but also actually driving innovation at a pace uh, that is really focused on you. What, is, what are your pain points? What can we do for you? And this is sort of what we've done in the past, uh, well, the past six years now. So last year, we launched 159 uh, new services and major features. Uh, uh, but we are um, already doing rather well today as well. You know, we already lost, uh, launched 53 new services uh, and new features this year. Uh, and we'll continue to work on, at, at, at this pace. Important there is that you give us feedback. You have to give us feedback. Where are, where, where are still your pain points? Yeah? How should you actually, uh, what is the sort of new technologies that you would like to see, or what are the new features that you like to see? We are very strong believers in rolling things out in a, in a lean way. Well, what does that mean? It means that we give you a minimal viable product, as it's called, so a product that is rock solid because you can base your business on it, but the feature set is the minimum feature set. And then we work with you to help that feature set drive exactly in the direction where you want it to go. Yeah, so this is purely yeah, customer-driven innovation. You decide what the new feature set is going to be. And why do we do that? Because actually, you know, Cloud computing has a tremendous impact on how T is being executed today, whether that is developers or whether that is operations. And so as such, you know, we do not know on forehand exactly what are the best features to deliver for you. You're the ones that are going to de determine that over time. Now, so of the numbers, so we've always used uh, so there's a storage numbers in, uh, in S3, so the number of objects stored in the simple storage service as an, uh, as an indicator of, you know, how, how is this business overall growing? Uh, a few weeks ago, we measured again, and we are well over 2 trillion objects in S3. Most importantly is that that happened in a period of 10 months. Yeah, so it took us a number of years. It took us well over five years to get to 1 trillion objects. It took us 10 months to get to 2 trillion. So you can imagine that this, this is really a business that is exploding, although the way I feel it, we haven't even hit the knee of that hockey stick yet, but we will, we will, we will get there. Uh, another metric that we've used is the number of clusters uh, launched on, uh, on EC2. Um, Elastic MapReduce is an uh, implementation, a managed implementation of Hadoop or MapReduce, um, where we run analytics clusters for our customers. And since it launched, which is now about two years ago, well, a bit more than two years ago, um, we've, we've launched well over five and a half million clusters. Uh, another thing that we have actually recently reduced, be, uh, announced, because many of you have asked for this, um, is a certification for AWS cloud prof professionals. That means that you can start taking exams and be certified for being a developer, an architect, or a DevOps uh, ad administrator. And there are three different levels in there. Uh, there's associate level, there's the professional level, and then just the a master level, I believe. Uh, so um, you will be able to take uh, exams in that and, and get certified. So on one hand, uh, that's maybe because you want to work with some of your partners uh, and want to demonstrate that you actually are an AWS expert, or it might be because you know, internally in your organization, you, know, you, you want to get some credit for uh, the knowledge of AWS that you've acquired over time. Um, one of the... Uh, one of the greater technologies I think that we've uh, launched in the past uh, year uh, was DynamoDB. This is a NoSQL database, or a non-relational database, as I like to uh, call them. Uh, and, and it has a, a number of very particular features. Um, 
and I'll talk about that in, in, a, in a minute, um, but the thing that we've also recently announced in this case is a new indexing mechanism for it. Um, this is a good example, actually, of demonstrating that we launch things with a simpler interface. So we launched it with the ability to have, take hash keys and to take range keys as, as well, uh, such that you can ask for, for example, give me all the orders from Werner in the past month. Um, but we really waited for feedback from our customers to determine what sort of the next interface should be that we should deliver there. And, and many of our customers have asked for secondary indices. Yeah, meaning that you want to be able to index on the other attributes that are in the, in the data schema. Yeah, so um, also newest and local secondary indices. We launched that about a week and a half ago, um, and many of our customers are already using this. Important with, with uh, DynamoDB is that uh, we really fought hard when we designed it about what should be the configuration interface. I don't know if any or many of you have ever configured sort of these larger database clusters, but it's a sort of a nightmare. Yeah, and why is it a nightmare? It's because you are always, you have to really tune them, tune them very well to get the right performance out of them. And, and with undetermined, and with when things are growing and things like that, databases are always the bottleneck. Uh, about a year, year and a half ago, I was at uh, South by Southwest. It's a big festival in, in the south of the U.S., um, in Austin. Uh, and there was a panel there by sort of uh, the architects of all the major internet services. So the Twitters, the Facebook, what is it, Reddit, uh, Netflix. And, and what the, there was a panel about scaling, and what, what they were asked is that, what, what was always the bottleneck in your scaling? And the answer was uniform. It was always the database. Yeah, and so we asked ourselves, what should we be doing with DynamoDB to make sure that it does not become a bottleneck? So instead of giving you 20 configuration knobs, we thought that the reason why you want to do this configuration is that you want consistent performance out of your database. So why don't we give it an interface that is focused on consistent performance? So you can ask for 20,000 reads and 50,000 writes a second, and the database will configure itself automatically behind the scenes to make sure that you are guaranteed this performance. And so that changes the whole world of databases. Because suddenly, the database is no longer a bottleneck. And so the bottleneck shifts into the application architecture, which is a great thing to have. Yeah? If your database is no longer a bottleneck, you can really free yourself and make, make architectures much simpler. So in, uh, two, in about two years ago, that was the wrong button. Uh, about two years ago, Jeff wrote a uh, letter to shareholders sort of about the principles behind uh, a number of the platforms that we've built, whether it's on publishing and whether it's AWS, things like that. And uh, really understanding what are we trying to achieve with these platforms. Yeah, and for us, it's really important. The goal behind it is to allow you to pursue your dreams. Yeah, it allows you to build anything that you want. Uh, it's actually an interesting letter to write, uh, read because Jeff talks about a few other things as well that are really principled behind sort of this platform thinking. One of the things being that you should not have a gatekeeper on this platform. If there's nobody on this platform that will say no to you, you, will can, you can do anything that you want. And that's the goal of it. But more importantly, you know, it has a true transformative nature. And of course, when you think about transformers, you know, you don't really think about businesses, you think about transformers, of course. Um, of course, nice point is that, you know, Bumblebee is actually being rendered on AWS by a company called Atomic Fiction. Yeah? So if you think about transformation, there's uh, sort of three different things that I want to touch on. Uh, sort of, what are sort of the, the driving forces today uh, behind, behind transformation, what are the bigger pictures there? Um, sort of, and then do a review of different verticals um, in which uh, we've touched, or where, where we touched the, uh, the transformation. Uh, and sort of finish off with a little bit of a look towards the future about what are sort of the things that I expect will happen uh, in the coming year or two years. So first of all, you know, sort of what, what drives this transformation? Yeah? And, and I want to take a step back. If you, look at, if you look at what's happening out in the economy, you know, there's an abundance of products in the market. 
there's, there's intensifying competition, there's increasing consumer power where consumers determine what is going to happen, what they're going to consume, at what point and when. I also think there is a sort of a reducing customer loyalty. Oops. Let me just fix this. Okay. This is uh, reduced con uh, customer loyalty towards products. Yeah, so where in the past you may have actually be able to predict as a company that, that the same set of consumers will buy the same product, or the, same, the next generation of your product over and over again, I think that's definitely a time uh, that has passed. And uh, combine it with the fact that there is limited capital in the market, it is actually really uncertain whether your products are going to be successful or not. Yeah, and this is not a, a, a new pattern. I think we've seen this uh, coming back in, in many, other, uh, many other businesses as well, or sides of the business. Now, if it's uncertain, if there is great uncertainty in the market, yeah, and for example, Eric Ries mentioned, uh, calls the, uh, gives a definition of, of a startup, for example, being a company that builds new products um, or services under conditions of extreme uncertainty. But actually, for enterprises, this is exactly the same thing that's true today. Yeah. The, the re whether or not your products are going to be successful is extremely uncertain. And so when things are uncertain, you need different resource methodologies. Yeah, you need to acquire resources on demand. You need to release them when you no longer need them. Uh, you need to only pay for what you use. You need to use other score competencies and shift CapEx to OpEx. Now, this looks like as if this has been designed for cloud computing, but that's not the case. These are patterns that are already there in resource management for a very long period of time. Think about HR. Yeah? So how do we deal with actually with, with, uh, acquiring um, or hiring people for a certain period of time, release them when you no longer need them? Yeah? You have a pay-as-you-go model there. You hire people for certain short periods of time to get their competency in, um, and you release them when you no longer need them. These are patterns that have uh, existed in manufacturing and in HR for a long period of time. The fact that cloud computing is coming on the market now with these resource models makes them so popular because they fit exactly in the larger economic patterns that we're seeing at this moment. So let's, let's look a bit at the, the benefits of cloud computing because I've always thought that cloud computing should not be defined by its technologies. It's purely defined by the benefits of it. So I think there's six main, main, main benefits in this. So first of all, of course, you know, there's no longer, you do not have to put any capital up anymore. Yeah, so getting access to any resource, you shift capital to variable. Yeah. So you actually take that, it's not just that. It's if, if, if that would be the only case, that would be sort of limited. Yeah, but what's also important that the elasticity yeah, and the ability for you to shed capacity when you no longer need it actually means that you can reduce your variable expense, your operational expense, equally to the way that you actually did not have to put any capital up anymore. Uh, so there's great, great examples here. I'll talk a bit further about the airport Nuremberg later on. Uh, but all of these, we've seen a significant reduction in, in operational expense next to the fact that they didn't have to put up any capital. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been responsible for capacity planning of a relatively popular website, for example, but actually capacity planning is hard in the world of physical resources. Yeah? If these resources are becoming all programmable, then you can actually have this elasticity follow the patterns that you need. So instead of uh, always being either overscaled and as such losing capital, or being underscaled and as such disappointing your, 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 your customers, you can meet the exact demands of, of your business. Let me give you an example here of Amazon.com. So this is a typ typical week of, Am of Amazon.com, and our rule of thumb for capacity planning was 15% over peak. Yeah, so that means that on a weekly basis, you about lose or have unused 40% of your capacity. Yeah, you know what? That's fine. 
actually, I know quite a few enterprises that will be extremely happy if they would have a utilization of 60% of their, of their resources. Yeah, but things are a bit harder because this is November. Yeah, at the end of November, there's Thanksgiving and Black Friday and Cyber Monday and all these kind of things. So the peaks are much higher. Using the same rule for the month of November, yeah, you see that uh, for the month of November, I would have lost about 75% of my capacity, just standing empty, just to be ready for those two peaks at the end of the year. You can imagine that this, for a, a, a retail business like Amazon.com, you know, with, with razor-thin margins, uh, this is pretty disastrous. Uh, and it's not that you actually can, uh, can, start, um, can start bringing this capacity in two days ahead of time, no. I mean, it's not like driving up to Costco and putting about a few servers back in your truck, but it, this is really something that you have to prepare for for months ahead of time. So for many months, you're tremendously overscaled. November 10, 2010, we shut down the last physical web server for uh, Amazon.com, and a year later, we did the same thing for all of the European properties. So now, traffic looks like this. Yeah? I can really scale this on a single server uh, ahead of time to make sure that I have always sufficient capacity for no matter what happens um, in, that, uh, in that month. But it's not just a matter of cost. You know, we spend a lot of time always talking about cost because cost is important. But, you know, many of our customers will tell you that uh, while they came on board with a cost picture in mind, the, the most important thing for them is the agility, the ability to move faster, the ability to go time to market to reduce that significantly um, as being the most important property out of, uh, out of the cloud computing benefits. Yeah, and so there's a great, uh, great quote by uh, Joey Ito, who is the director of the, uh, uh, of the media lab at MIT, that uh, if you really want to drive innovation, you have to reduce the cost of failure to zero. Yeah, so most importantly here is that if you, know, you want to do experiments, and I see many more businesses uh, being interested in, in experimentation with products, because you do not know in these times of uncertainty how successful your products are going to be, uh, if we can reduce the cost of failure there, if you do not have to put up massive amounts of resources before you can, can get started, then you know, the likelihood that you can be successful is much higher. Yeah, and of course, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you have to make use of others' core competencies, especially if these things don't differentiate you. Yeah? Uh, and when Nick Carr wrote this uh, famous article about IT doesn't matter, he didn't really mean that IT didn't matter to the business. What he said is that the core pieces of IT are not a differentiation. Everybody has to do exactly the same thing. Yeah, and instead of actually pouring all your best intellectual capital into those layers, maybe you should focus them on your customer, on building better products, than on doing exactly the same thing that everybody else needs to do. And one of those things, for example, is uh, the ability to go global. I don't know if any of you have ever worked for a company that needed to make data center contracts in Japan or in Singapore. Now, you can imagine that that is not trivial, just dealing with lawyers and network capabilities and ISPs and things like that. But today, you can just go to the management console in AWS, push one button, and launch a complete application in Sydney or in Singapore, or in Tokyo, wherever you want. So these benefits are the ones, actually, that I think drive the, the reason why, why cloud computing is so popular to today. And there's also sort of, in my eyes, still a seventh one, that is that is also if everything becomes a programmable unit, if there's no hardware involved anymore, then suddenly this world becomes unconstrained. And we will start building architectures that we could never build before. Yeah, and so I also think that if you look at many of the newer sort of internet-style applications that have been built on top of this platform, whether it's Pinterest or um, uh, Instagram or any of those newer kind of uh, applications and architectures, we will find that you find a whole range of very unconstrained applications being built. Um, I gave a talk at uh, the reInvent um, event that we did in, uh, in Las Vegas about three months ago, four months ago, 
Um, if, you want, if you're interested in this new type of architectures, you should, uh, you should maybe watch that, uh, that video of it. And a good example of that is, for example, the, uh, uh, the Obama campaign in the U.S. So A of A is the uh, Obama for America campaign. Uh, at this particular URL, you can find a very detailed description of what this, this group has built on top of AWS um, to actually be able to be ready for that one day in October or November, whatever it was. So if you look at uh, sort of the old world of this, it's all about, you know, development cycles that run years. Uh, you know, the experimentation is, uh, is quite expensive. Uh, and there's not that much flexibility, and, and the availability of these resources is actually relatively scarce. If you have deployments that may take months uh, to actually get, get, get done, um, you're not going to experiment very much. Now, AWS, that works as a very different group. You know, you can get resources on minutes, it doesn't cost you anything up front, it's totally elastic, and there's lots of these resources for you to use. But, you know, instead of believing me that this is indeed the, the case, uh, I would like to introduce you to uh, Chad Fowler, who's the uh, CTO of uh, uh, Sex Wunderkinder, um, a company that makes one of the applications that I'm, uh, that I'm a big user of myself. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. So we were going to talk about um, scaling with AWS, and we wanted to start by actually, instead of just talking about a success story, start with a failure story, because I think that's what teaches uh, best. So we're going to talk about success, failure, uh, and success again with AWS uh, very quickly, and how we changed the way we thought about how to work with cloud computing and how that's le led to uh, increased productivity and uh, increased scalability. So Six Wonderkinder creates a beautiful uh, pr uh, productivity tool called Wonderlist. Uh, how many of you are users of Wonderlist? So the rest of you, please download it today. It's free. <laughs> it's free, but you can pay for it as well. Um, it's a very, very popular thing. We like to say it's the fastest growing uh, to-do list in the world. Ever since we launched about two years ago, we continue to have a, a steep upward trajectory of users. Uh, it, is, it was originally built and still is built as a sort of traditional database-backed web API, all the sort of things that you might expect. Ours is a Ruby stack. We're running on Postgres. We've got all the nice things that you can run on AWS in it. Uh, and it's also one of those things where we have deployed servers. So we set it up, and you know, we're in AWS, of course, and we have been. We provisioned a bunch of servers. Uh, we installed the software on them. We upgraded the servers, all the things that I used to do in the 1990s. So that's how we started off using AWS. Uh, a couple of months ago, I guess uh, late December, we decided that it was time to finally launch a complete rewrite, uh, beautiful native clients, web, Windows, Android, iOS, Mac, and it was very popular. So, of course, we were elated. We were very happy about it. We launched, and within nine weeks, we, we added 600,000 new users who collectively created 30 million new tasks in the system. So this was a great success for us. However, uh, each one of these users might have five or six different clients. Who knows? That might be polling all the time, beating, beating, beating our servers to death. Um, and notice I said servers there, right? So it kind of fell apart. Now, we're in AWS, and I'm supposed to be talking about how we succeeded with AWS, but we were thinking about it wrong. We weren't ready for this problem. Um, we were thinking about things as if it were the 1990s or the early 2000s. We were thinking of servers that we had to maintain in the cloud. So where did we go wrong? We got into the situation where we were firefighting for like a month and we were supposed to be having the most positive event in the company's history, and instead it was this tragic, stressful, terrifying feeling. You don't know what's going on. You don't know how to fix it. You just try things and try things. You've probably all experienced something like this in your careers in technology. Um, certainly the answer is not Amazon Web Services. That is not where we went wrong. But where we went wrong was we tried to think of AWS as just a tool set. And more importantly, we tried to think of it as just another source of servers. So we'll get back to that in a little bit, but I'm going to take a quick detour and talk to you about the term legacy and software. So uh, 
how many of you would like actively search the web and look for a job maintaining legacy software? <laughs> All right. Cobol for the win. We, this term has been maligned in our industry, and we use it as almost a synonym for crufty and bad and terrible and something that you want to get rid of and something you want to kill. Um, I want that bike. But in the rest of the world, in the rest of the, in my life even, when I hear the word legacy, I think of it as a positive thing, like an uplifting story of my life that I might leave to my children and their children and their grandchildren that would inspire them in the future, or an inheritance or an endowment. It's always a positive thing. But for some reason in the software world, legacy is a bad word. So how, I've been thinking about this for a while now, how can we start to think about as developers, as technologists, people who can leave a positive legacy in software? Well, it's really hard. It's hard because, according to the Standish Chaos Report, most software projects don't even succeed. You see the green bars are successful. So you're lucky if you even launch software that you work on. And I know I've spent at least a full, continuous year of my life developing software that never saw the light of day. What a waste of my life, right? Then, uh, anecdotally, I would say that for business software, the average lifespan is about five years. Now, why is this? Because it gets crufty, and it gets unmaintainable, and it's static, and you can't change it, and you're afraid of it, so all you want to do is throw it away. So looking at the rest of the world, I have a little chihuahua and uh, a little dog, and I've dropped her accidentally on occasion, I must admit, and I've taken her with me to India and back, and now back here to, to Germany, and she's been in all these different situations where she should have died. She's 16 years old. She's still going, though. How is she still going? I don't even take care of myself, and look at me. I'm 39 years old, and I'm okay. I'm still here. So why is it that I don't have to maintain myself or my dog, and they can continue, and they can live longer than software? It's crazy. I worked so hard to maintain software, and it doesn't live this long. <laughs> it's because, to oversimplify, sorry for any biologists in the audience, but it's because of a thing called homeostasis, which is your body's way of regulating itself. And I'm going to really oversimplify and say that parts of your body do things that are bad for other parts of your body, and you have a control system where these things fight each other. Bad things happen inside of your body, and then they're, then they're killed by other parts of your body. Um, and if you can't do this, you die. Like, you can actually reach a state of homeostatic imbalance, is what they call it in the biology world. And if you, if you stop being able to do this, you die. So the good news, though, this is kind of terrifying, but the good news is you're already dying right now, all of you. Um, we have about 50 trillion cells in our body, and we lose 3 million per second. So think of all the death that's happening in this room. It's really uplifting. <laughs> but somehow by the end of our lives, you know, we can still go on for years and years and years and be the same being, be the same system. So I like to ask polls. I have a bunch of Twitter followers. I like to ask poll or, or take polls on Twitter. And I took one where I said, what are the oldest surviving systems that basically you like to use today? And I got a bunch of answers. If you're a software developer or a Unix geek, you, you recognize a lot of these. But as I started parsing through the answers, I saw that they all fell into one of two categories. They were either complete systems or small components that made up complete systems, kind of like organisms and their cells. So systems versus components. And we can actually see other examples in the technology field of stuff that lives for a long time. For example, these cars that can still go down the street. And they were developed when, when we had such a crude understanding of technology. Amazon, and I don't mean AWS, but I mean Amazon as a, as a, as a company and an e-commerce portal, it's old. It's old software, but it's doing great. It gets better and better, right? So, in the software world, what is a cell? This is the question we have to start asking ourselves, and what is a system? Because I think if we understand this and we do it correctly, we're going to develop systems that can survive. And my take on it is that you should always strive, in every case you can, to create tiny components, tiny, tiny components, trivial components, and then you should throw them away regularly, intentionally, plan to throw these components away because they're so cheap and so simple that you don't mind doing that. 
This also f allows you to force heterogeneity in your system. You're going to upgrade and upgrade and upgrade. Why upgrade the entire system at once? Do like your body, upgrade the cells one piece at a time. Upgrade to a newer technology, to a newer language, et cetera. So anyway, this brings us back to Amazon Web Services. Servers are like cells in Amazon Web Services. So this is, this is how we deal with servers. This is just a simple wrapper script. It shows all the stuff in our load balancer for one application. And you can, you can see them there, and then you can just kill them. And the beautiful thing about this is we can do this whenever we want. I did it just in our production system just so I could take a screenshot for this talk, and it was OK. That's really cool, as long as you're measuring everything. So we spend our days, and my wife always knows what I'm working because she sees these colors on my screen, but we spend our days looking at these things. But they have allowed us, and this flexibility has allowed us to make some significant improvements in our scalability. This is master database load because of something we did, just swapping these things around. We can also do canary in the coal mine deployments where we say, OK, here's a piece of software that we really want to put out, but we're afraid of it. So let's just put it out in small drips and drabs, and oh no, it screwed everything up. We have to roll it back. But it's OK, because we didn't upgrade the whole thing. It's not an all-night endeavor. You just go, oops, nope, we'll, we'll try again later. We might do this multiple times a day. And it leads us from the prior negative state of being afraid to change anything, of feeling like, and this is my entire career I'm telling you about now, of feeling like production is this golden, scary thing to the ability to make fearless, constant change and to evolve our business to meet our, meet our users' needs. And instead of not knowing what the system limits are and being afraid of them, we can perform our own crash tests and just like scale down and find the system limits. And, and like you can see, we did it there. We said, OK, this is actually what we need absolutely to stay up. And we almost went down there. And then we brought it back up. And then finally, one last idea that I haven't done yet, but it's, a, and it's, it's an inspiring example of this from Pinterest, which is another AWS customer. They are using spot instances, which you might think of as something that's just a cost-saving measure. You can basically bid on instances and say, give me the, these when they're available. And here's the terrifying thing. Amazon will then kill them when the price goes up, and you're, you're unable to meet it. So that sounds insane, right? But if you, if you work toward this, you will build a system that can live longer. You will recognize and you will force yourself into a mindset that AWS is more than a tool set. It's an architectural mindset. It's 21st century technology architecture, as Werner said. So with this, I believe that you can go forth and you can build healthy, long-lasting applications. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chad. Um, it's a great story about you know, how people um, are thinking differently about how to use resources. Yeah? And that, uh, that it's sometimes easy to migrate things over, which was what they did early on, and treat it as a server or treat it as an environment like that. But that sometimes you get the benefits out of it by realizing that these are just software components and they're not the traditional hardware boxes that you're growing up with. So, well, we've looked at uh, sort of what are the bigger drivers behind uh, the benefits of cloud computing. Why does it fall into the right spot at this moment in the, uh, in the economic uh, patterns? Um, why don't we have a look at actually uh, sort of the different industries um, that are using cloud computing and how it has transformed that particular industry. Yeah, and, and I like to believe that there is hardly a vertical out there that is not being impacted at this moment by cloud computing whether that's oil and gas, whether it's media, whether it's energy, whether it's pharma, life sciences, all of them are making use of our, uh, of our services and are seeing radical change in the way they can, they can do their business, in the way that they can be competitive, in the way that they can build new products to the market, but also in the way that they can actually reduce cost and, and be more, be more customer-centric. And so every industry is, is transformed by, by the use of cloud computing. So if you look at, uh, for example, take a few of these sort of different uh, verticals and see sort of the impact there. The media and advertisement is, is an obvious one. If you look at, uh, uh, this is, these are the numbers from the uh, Newspaper Association of America. This is ad revenue. Yeah? 
ad revenue is at pre-1950s levels. Yeah, it's obviously that that is not um, a way to build a sustainable business in the newspaper industry today. So most of these newspapers are all interested, or, or need, I mean, not only newspapers, also any type of media or anything like that, is looking for new ways to monetize their, their content because they can no longer rely on the old style of broadcasting at the moment that they like to broadcast this either uh, sort of video or maybe bring your newspapers to you. So yeah, you can look at uh, a very large range of uh, customers on AWS, and most of them, you know, the, the largest newspapers in the world uh, are, are running on this platform, building new products to see, you know, whether they can actually re-monetize the content that they have. Um, and there's a few interesting things. Like, for example, if you would visit the um, fashion.telegraph.co.uk, you see how they are actually making use by pulling all sorts of content from different sort of um, different properties that they have and build a complete new product um, to bring towards their customers. Of course, in the US, uh, Netflix is, uh, is, is really popular. I heard rumors that that's about 35% of the uh, prime time traffic on the internet in the US is Netflix traffic. Yeah. Um, but, you, uh, but Netflix, of course, being a large customer of our platform, also competing on that platform, by the way, with Amazon, dot, uh, uh, Amazon Video on, the, on, the, on demand. Um, but Netflix uh, recently launched here in the EU as well. And for them, it was just a matter of being able to lift and shift over their operation to the EU West region without having to do that much more investment in actually acquiring new data centers and things like that. Uh, lots of uh, TV streaming these days. This is a, an application from uh, ABC Disney in the US. It's called ABC Watch. Uh, and what they do is basically upload one stream, live stream of TV into the AWS cloud. And then in real time, it's being transcoded for all the different devices out there that are watching TV. Uh, and, and what they do is they will do live ad insertion uh, depending on the location of the device or they will actually respect blackout periods and, and insert video on demand there um, if there is a particular area where something cannot be shown at that, at that, that moment in time. Um, but, you know, of course, here in Germany, you know, we have uh, quite a few uh, customers as well in the, in the media space, uh, Spiegel.tv, uh, for, for example, but also one of the, the newer TV stations, or web TV. Uh, and I would like to uh, introduce Nikolai Lung Lungolius, um, from Snee van Morgan to, uh, to talk about their product. <laughs> Thank you very much, Werner. It's an honor talking here. I'm a bit nervous. The last time I stood as in front of an audience that big, I was 18 years old, drunk, and holding an electric guitar, so that's different. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm Nikolai. Um, the company is called Schnee von Morgan. It's funny in German, but intranslatable, so we haven't thought about international expansion yet. Um, we are doing web, web TV, and um, I'm a TV guy. I, I, like, I like television. I watch television a lot. I used to do it more than today, but it's like I, I really love television. So we, we thought it might be a great idea to build a company around it, and before we built that company, I used to build up TV stations as a uh, project manager. It happened by accident, but that's what I did for 10 years. I was project manager for classical, like satellite dish TV stations. And then we wanted to move on and um, wanted to move to, to the internet and do something really new. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's what we did. And today, the, these are our customers. I'm going to start from the bottom. We are really I talked to my lawyers yesterday, and he told me I'm not allowed to talk about the patent, but it's going, coming this year, and we're going to completely change advertising market in the uh, web TV. I hope I'm allowed to say that. It's InfoQ. They're doing technical. Um, I think they're from Canada, and we're doing the player and um, video deployment on, on Amazon for them. It's all on Amazon. We just started to work together with Homer JDE, which you haven't heard of, but uh, if you're 20 two years old and playing computer games all day, you would have. Um, they are casting computer games. They, they are awesome. Um, 
We're doing uh, video management for Tape TV. DCTP TV is the web TV channel of Alexander uh, Kluge, who's also awesome. And um, last uh, two years ago, we launched Spiegel.tv together with Der Spiegel, one of the biggest German web TV stations. And as you can imagine, the technical stack for, for, for this, for, you see, for Der Spiegel and DCTP TV, we're doing everything. We're doing the, the storage, the transcoding, the management, the um, delivery of the videos, the um, statistics, advertisement delivery, everything. So this is a huge technical problem for somebody who hasn't done anything in IT before. So that was kind of the, the, the beginning of, of our company. And we are, we are developing on AWS since 2006. So we are kind of the grandfathers of cloud computing. The, I, I, I used to think that cloud years are like dog years, you know? It's like seven to 10 human years, so I'm like 49 to 70 dog uh, cloud years old. So this is what a grandfather today looks like in, in cloud computing. And I get asked often why we choose to do it on, on Amazon. And this is kind of a, a wrong way of thinking because there was, at the time we, we thought our new TV products, there was no alternative to, to that. It was like when, when we first read about Amazon and the new ideas for us, that was mind blowing. It, it opened up possibilities that hadn't been there before. And I tried pushing these ideas into the enterprise world and they hated me for it, literally. I mean, like some, some guy took me apart and, and, and he told me in a one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, talk, I am going to destroy you. That's what happened to me in 2006. <laughs> and then Amazon came and gave us this amazing freedom to do what we want with a chaotic team of, of new and young people. And no, that's wrong. Ah, these are our people. Um, so, so we are eight people. Eight, eight employees that, that, I was, that, we, that I know of. And by that I mean we, we pay money to Amazon to solve several problems for us. And I know that there, there's a huge amount of people working for us there, but I don't know their names. And that's awesome um, because it solves tons of problems for us. And these guys that work for us, they, they're in three cities and on one island, so they're like everywhere, every time. They, they, they are chaos. We're, we're in Hamburg, Berlin, Vienna, and Tenerife now, isn't that cool? <laughs> and the guy on Tenerife, I think he's 25 years old, and he's on, like, I think it's cosplay. I'm not, he, sometimes he dresses like a carrot and drives bicycle. So these are kind of the people working for the company. I, I, <laughs> um, we, we got lot of, lots of small kids, like five kids in, in the company. I mean, not working, but the people got, got kids. <laughs> so, um, so we're not that fall tolerant. We, we don't want phones ringing at night. <laughs> All are women, one, uh, which is kind of IT typical. If I look in that crowd, he's here. Uh, um, she's pregnant. And two of the coders don't get up before lunch. So this is kind of our human stack on, on, on doing things. And um, so, but, but it means we are brilliant in shifting resources around continent and time zones. We, we can do that. And we, we do it with Amazon as well. So this is kind of the technical stack we do now. We got on average 500 requests per second on static objects. I don't know if that's huge, but I think it's kind of tremendous. At least for, I couldn't play it on the drums, you know. Uh, we're in three data centers. We're on average peaks. We're like 15 to 150 servers. Our data throughput on an average peak is four gigabit per second, which is kind of a lot, I think. Um, we got six applications in the several app stores, all of which are top 100 or top 10 apps now. We developed for these uh, HBB TV, smart, smart TV things. We use Amazon and, and other services to acquire that, but Amazon is always our, our backbone. I can't stress more how much Amazon is like a, it's, it's even more than a partner to us. It's kind of part of our company, of, of what we do, right? We're doing ad service stuff. Like, and actually, today, we're doing prototypes for, for DAX companies. Like these, I mean, they don't know those people, but 
the, these people do prototypes for DEX companies, and we just acquired a third, so we are prototyping for 10% of all DEX 30 companies today. That's uh, awesome. And we do all that with only 10,000 CPU hours a month, which is nothing. It's an average of 14 servers, I think. And that means that we inhaled everything Amazon told us on how to do brilliant cloud computing stacks that well that they don't make no money with us. <laughs> because that costs nothing, right? Our, our coffee machine is actually more expensive. <laughs> and I know what you're thinking. It's like we're, we're the little mice and the, the elephant is afraid of us. But uh, actually, I wanted to get rid of an urban myth. I really looked it up, and it's true. The, um, yeah, you, you should Google it. Uh, the truth is they, they, they did that. They put an elephant in a cave, and they put mice in the cave, and look what's happening. Actually, mice are there all the time because there's a straw, I think it's called. OK. But, but what the elephant really does is he looks interested for a small amount of time, and then he stumps on the mice. <laughs> True story. And, um, <laughs> and, and, and that's what, what happens to us all the time. It's like when we, we're in contact with enterprise businesses, they, they looked interested for a small amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> and then we really got to be fast. So, so these are kind of my advices if you want to start up in the cloud. I can advise you if you're an enterprise business, but if you want to start up in the cloud, it's be brave, transparent, and polite. And I think transparency is the most important weapon you've got um, against the intransparent old enterprise business. And I, th I think that's the most important thing of what Amazon does, is that pricing is so transparent. And they are so transparent with their faults. Like, if something goes wrong, they are really addicted in telling you about it, what did go wrong. And that's awesome because it's completely different concerning the old world. And the second one is learn to think in the cloud, by which I mean don't only go there. It's not like you got 80 servers in a data center and now you push them to another country or thing like that. But you, you might save money with it or not, but it's not going to make a difference. If you got the opportunity to rethink your, your business and start from the beginning on a white piece of paper and to think it in, in, in small steps, then you're able to solve problems as big as the problem we got with only 10,000 CPU hours a month and your phone's not ringing. Um, th that's awesome and that's new. That's making a difference. And my last advice is don't get stumped, so be, be quick and run if it comes. Yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm a huge fan of Amazon. I wrote a book about it. So if you want to do me a favor, go to Amazon and buy it. <laughs> it it's in German, but if you're English native speaking, it's got pictures. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. That was fun, at least. Um, yeah, it's great to see, uh, you know, uh, fundamental technologies being developed and used by so many other companies here in Germany. Um, so let's, let's take a look at a few other uh, verticals. Yeah? So um, healthcare and biotech uh, is, of course, a, a, an area that I think is tremendously in flux. And I'll talk a bit more about that later, I think, especially with, you know, all these new devices being, de being developed that generate enormous amounts of data. Um, but also... Um, you know, a lot of impact from, for example, data analytics. Uh, there's, a, there's a great story about GE who uh, instrumented, or instrumented, they, they attached RFIDs to, uh, to all patients in Mount Sinai Hospital in, in Miami, Florida, uh, and also in all the other assets. And they tracked them for a certain period of time. And they were able to actually optimize the way that the hospital was uh, allocating resources and were able to actually um, spend does it uh, uh, allow 10,000 more patients in that hospital during that year while saving about $200 million? Yeah, and I think so, um, you know, healthcare is clearly an area 
uh, where a lot of innovation is going to happen, and many of those being driven by you know, big data as well as cloud technologies. There's a lot of impact, uh, of course, eh? but, but also if you look at biotech, especially in pharma, for a very long period of time, um, these companies had very long, very long product cycles. Uh, and so if, uh, if there is intensifying competition, then you can no longer afford to have these long product cycles. So how can you speed them up? Um, and also, how there are other things that you can speed up? For example, uh, drug research. Uh, so if we uh, just, just look at a few companies there, uh, Unilever is, of course, a well-known name, um, you know, originally uh, a Dutch company, but they make use of the Eagle Genomic Platform out of uh, the UK um, that gives you a, a, a genome um, research platform on top of AWS. And say so they do this to, to, for example, develop new toothpastes. Yeah, where really they look at what are the impact of certain bacteria on genes that live in your, in your gums, or to develop new deodorants. They don't just go for the smell, they actually do research on you know, what are the microbes that live in your armpit and how do they impact on genes um, uh, to actually develop new and better deodorants. But the idea is to move much faster, because many of these, many of these research problems require substantial um, uh, capacity for compute. And by going wider now, be able to, to allocate many more, um, many more cores, they're actually able to, to really speed up uh, some, of these, uh, some of these product developments. And there's also many new uh, devices coming into the market. This is a uh, Illumina's um, sequencer. Uh, so where is it? When the first genome was sequenced, that costed something about, it costed actually a few billion dollars. Uh, and the result of it was actually carried around on an iPod. But, um, but these days, these devices are just hooked into the internet by themselves and store their data directly in S3, such that the development tools that you can use can make use of, of any level of, uh, of compute power to do the analytics. Uh, and also, there's, there's other areas in healthcare. I think there's lots of, uh, you'll see that many, um, many hospitals or many pharmas will actually collaborate on doing drug research or on drug trials, on clinical trials. Um, but also, there's a, uh, there's a government institution in the US, it's called the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. Um, their, one of their biggest challenges was that they have to collect information about diseases in the US um, and then serve that back to researchers and government officials, but also to the general public. Um, and, and that was a technology that happened by phone and by fax. And as you can imagine, that, that doesn't really allow for sort of a modern collaboration. So they developed a platform called Biosense 2.0. And in Biosense 2.0, all these data flows into this central application that lives in the cloud, um, you know, where, um, if you look at it, where there's many different components to do data analytics, and then in real time, serve information back to both researchers as well as uh, officials and, and uh, you know, hospitals and things like that. So if you look at sort of the interactive graph for um, the past winter, this is about actually looking at what's the influenza rates in real time in the different states in the US. Um, you know, instead of guessing, what happens now is that you can actually make use of real-time data. And this is also a service that's available for the public uh, to use. And another collaborative area uh, where AWS is involved with is that is the, the Final Thousand Genomes Project. Yeah, so, as I mentioned, we, we did the first genome that delivered it was kind of interesting to see the genome and see the DNA of, uh, of an individual. Um, but it's, of course, much more interesting to actually compare them. So the NIH, the Na National Institute of Health in the US, started a project called the Thousand Genome Project. Um, that actually results in data sets that are something like 200, 200 terabytes and larger. Um, it's obviously that you, that you cannot um, actually just distribute this easily to anyone to use. Plus that most institutions do not have any, any uh, do not have enough compute power to be able to process these sort of data sets. We now have, um, I think, well over 1,700 uh, genomes, or 2,000 I see here on the slide. Um, and so all of these are available for anyone to use for free. 
yeah, we made this a public data set available for everyone. Um, another area where we've been involved with is, for example, the, uh, um, the Cancer Research Institute in the UK. Uh, they had very, very, very large data sets that actually still need to be inspected by humans. And they didn't really understand, or they didn't really have a good approach to how to do this, how to get many volunteers to actually look at this data. Um, and they decided to go the gamification route. So one weekend, they organized a hackathon um, in, in London. And many people came together and built all sorts of games that actually could run on your phone or can, could be connected to your phone and operate on the data set that lives in, in AWS. Uh, and also make use of computational power that lives in AWS for individuals to sit on the bus in the morning and play this game for 10 minutes or 15 minutes and actually help um, sort of do um, cancer research in, in the process. Uh, other, uh, other partners that we have, for example, Cycle Compute uh, is a partner that builds very, very large HPC environments. The very large, I mean, you know, easily 50,000 cores or something like that. Yeah, so many of the c c cancer drug research is very brute force. It means you have a protein and you have a molecule. You try to slot that into the protein and see whether it fixed, fits. It's more or less like taking a key and trying whether it fits in the lock. Only you have 20 million keys that you have to try to fit into the lock. Uh, and most of this trying to fit in the lock is pretty computational intensive. So they did this for Schrodinger, which is a computational chemistry company. And this uh, project normally would have taken on their own hardware a number of months to run. And that hardware costed them $20 million. So Cycle Compute launched this on AWS by going wide, by having 50,000 cores. And they would be, were able to do the complete run that normally would take two months in three hours. And in those three hours, it only costed $15,000. Yeah, so that's the difference. If he can, and it's, it's amazing. Well, I mean, when we started this business, I didn't, didn't realize that we would be helping to change the way that cancer drug research is being done. But that's the reality of today, by having this unlimited amount of, of computational power at your fingertips. Let's look at another uh, vertical. Transportation is an interesting one. Um, again, it's a highly competitive one. It's, it's capital intensive. Uh, and there is you know, a lot of consumer engagement in this world. So take, for example, Airport Nuremberg. Uh, they started using us during the times of when there was an ash cloud. And it was obvious that there were very high peaks in where, where customers wanted to access both their web services or um, you know, any of the digital information that was there. Um, and so they moved over much of their digital operation over to AWS. But it also is very, it's a very important point here because they also store personal identifiable information. Yeah, and uh, given that personal identifiable information is, is subject to all sorts of regulation, um, they were able to make use of the cloud by using the, the, the right privacy and encryption techniques to store that data and to protect their customers there. Goal is another is an airline that is in, is, has a very interesting uh, uh, way of making use of our cloud services. Uh, they have all their, all their pilots now have tablets where they carry all the information on. I don't know if you've ever seen pilots go into the cockpit. They normally have these very big bags with them with all sorts of printed documentation uh, and all sorts of forms that they need to fill out. These guys have moved to a complete tablet environment. And so what happens when the, when the airplane touches down, immediately all these tablets sync with the cloud to get the latest updates of information um, and to actually up, up, upload all sorts of information uh, about, the, uh, about the journey that they've just taken. If you travel around the world, uh, like I do quite a bit, um, hospitality is one that is uh, obviously also uh, a, a, um, a, s a vertical that is completely changing. Yeah, there's, the travel is, uh, is rapidly growing. We see still all sorts of new hotels being built all around the world, uh, both from, uh, from low budget to very luxury hotels. And, and IT plays a very important role there. Often as a, as a customer in a hotel, you don't really notice that, but all these systems, all the resource systems are all heavily instrumented 
and, and being tracked. But all these hotels need to do the same thing. Yeah, and all these, and so we, while it is a very important component of their business, it is not a differentiating factor. Yeah, and for them, it's really important to actually take their resources out of the, out of the IT business and start focusing them on the customer, because that's where the competition is happening. The competition is happening on what you deliver for your customer, not what you can do as an IT organization. So, for example, the Four Seasons has moved all of their digital marketing uh, environments over to AWS. Um, the Intercontinental Hotel Group has, was it, 65,000 hotel rooms in 4,500 hotels. Uh, all of their reservation systems and the way that the reservation systems interact with the individual resource planning systems inside the hotels uh, runs on AWS. Uh, but also smaller hotels uh, make use of this. For example, there's a, um, a partner that we have called Hotel Logic. Um, who originally, who, which company is actually in India, but most of his companies are, around, most of the customers are around the world, smaller hotels in, in for example, South America, uh, the Middle East, all of these make use of a very high-end, um, you know, property management system uh, that is delivered to them as software as a service. And, and of course, these days, you know, there is, uh, we have a see shift happening also towards what's called the sharing economy, where uh, people make their rooms and their houses or their complete houses available for others to rent on services like Airbnb. And uh, Airbnb is one of those services that has been uh, built natively on top of AWS from the ground up for 100% to be able to deal with the tremendous growth that they've been seeing. But it's not only these new businesses. Yeah, I would, uh, would like to introduce to you someone that works for a... Uh, very traditional um, German business, uh, Jeremy Ward, who is the Senior Vice President of Information Technologies of uh, Kapinski, and is going to explain to you, tell, talk to you guys about how they are making use of AWS. Hello. So, I'm here to talk about Kempinski, Amazon, some monkeys. But first of all, and this really pains me because I'm English, congratulations to Bayern. <laughs> and Dortmund. It's a long way at last. So, Kempinski. Uh, most, hopefully, most of the German audience here will know about Kempinski. We are a five-star international luxury hotel brand. Um, we currently have 75 hotels under operation globally, nothing in the Americas. Uh, we have one hotel that we're looking at in Panama, but we do have quite an aggressive growth. In the next 12 months, we are looking to have 86 hotels. In the next three to five years, 127 hotels. It's quite an aggressive growth for a company of our size. Who are we? What defines our culture? Well, we have a number of DNA values. I'm not going to go deeply into each one, but we have a passion for luxury. All of our guests expect five-star luxury service. It's something we have to deliver. We like to create traditions. We're people-orientated. We have to make sure our staff deliver those, those luxury experiences. We have to look after our guests. We're straightforward, and from an IT point of view, and this is where the one I look after most of all, we like to make sure we have entrepreneurial performance. Now, we're seasoned hoteliers. We've been going since 1897, and this is a photo from, I think, the 1950s in, uh, in Munich. So, we have a long tradition. But we're also pioneers, and I think this is one of the, the areas that we like to focus on. We like to make sure, we like to be seen as, as innovators, and we like to be seen as pioneering. We were the first international hotel company to enter into the Chinese market, and it was in 1992. In 1992, China was a very different place than it is today. It's the same for Russia. In 1992, we were the first international hotel company, luxury hotel company, to enter the Russian market. Again, Russia, 
20, 21 years ago was a very different place than it is, it is now. Um, in China, we've now got 15 hotels. In Russia, we now have three hotels, but we're also expanding significantly into Eastern Europe. In 1998, we entered into the Middle Eastern market, but we didn't go into Dubai, where everyone would know. We went into one of the smaller emirates, Ajman, a little emirate north of Dubai. This allowed us to put a, a footprint into the Middle East, and we've now expanded significantly, and we're growing significantly. We've got two hotels opening in Saudi this year. Um, and we, it, it gave us a very good footprint, and, and uh, for those of you that may know, the Emirates Palace in Abu Dhabi is one of the world's leading hotels, is under management from Kempinski. We went into Africa in 2001, again, not into some of the, uh, the more well-known, not into uh, Cape Town or Johannesburg. We went into Djibouti, Chad, Zanzibar, Namibia. Um, we see Africa as a, as a huge growth for us, and this is one of the areas that we're, we're focusing on. Some of the other properties that we've got, hopefully here in Berlin, you all know the Adlon, very famous hotel. The Viarseiden on Maximilianstrasse in in Munich, uh, the Chagrin Palace Hotel in Turkey on the Bosphorus there, it's an old sultan's palace. In uh, Middle East and Africa, we have a, a new hotel on the Nile in Cairo, Djibouti as I mentioned, the Emirates Palace as I mentioned. These are palace hotels. The uh, hotel in Bangkok, we've recently opened a uh, big hotel and conference center in Jakarta and in Haitang Bay in China. So these are very different and very challenging locations that we have to address all of, the, um, all of the needs for our users and our guests. And if we have a look, we've got 12,000 new employees that will be coming on board in the next two to three years. It's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of employees for us to have to present and share our knowledge to. And a lot of what we do as a hotel company is share and man uh, is, is knowledge management. We're not an IT company. We are a hospitality company, and what we know is, is hospitality know-how. We have to share that with policies, procedures, training manuals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In 2010, we took a look at it, and we were starting to become an IT company. I was invoicing hotels for email usage. We were running our own uh, email servers. And it got to a point where we just said, look, this is getting ridiculous. We're growing. We're going to end up growing more data centers internally, more staff. And we went back to the drawing board and said, we're not an IT company. We're a hospitality company. So let's stop doing the IT stuff. Um, and we, we, we created a five-year plan. And we created a number of what we call guiding principles. One of those guiding principles was, wherever possible, let's move infrastructure and applications above property, or you can read above property as the cloud. So we had a look. Uh, we did a lot with the, the software as a service, the applications. I won't go into that today. But from the infrastructure side of things, we looked at it and we said, OK, there are a number of opportunities out there. After the due diligence, we decided to go with Amazon. We spoke to Amazon. and. They recommended a reseller, a company called CloudReach, based in the UK. Um, we got them over. They came over for a workshop. We looked at the technical issues. We looked at the commercial issues. And we made it happen. We looked at the security issues. And I think that was one of the very important things for us. But we, they showed us that we could do it. They showed that within five years, we would have a 40% cost saving. Very important that you have to when you're looking at this, you have to build in a, uh, a capital expense refresh. You know, we're no longer buying and replacing the servers internally. Um, I think if you try and do an ROI model within 18 months, it's very difficult, unless you're actually due to replace all of your hardware. So we had 147 servers sitting in our corporate office in, in Geneva, both physical and virtual. And we will, by the end of September this year have completed the four-phase project, and I'm hoping we will have less than 10 servers sitting in the office. The rest will be consolidated or sitting up on Amazon uh, in the instances.
We had a lot of challenges to get over. We worked very closely with the reseller. We worked very closely with Amazon. But we made it happen. So I did mention monkeys. I'm not going to sit here and give you lots of statistics and tell you about the gigabytes saved and the data that we're storing, and et cetera, et cetera, and CPU cycles. I'm going to tell you about monkeys. It's a little story, and I think it, it helps uh, show the reasons why we need to do things. So, a group of scientists took five monkeys, and they put them in a cage. In the cage, they put some step ladders, and on the top of the step ladders, they put a bunch of bananas. And the monkeys walked in, and they said, cool, free bananas. So they headed up the step ladder to get the bananas, and the scientists, being scientists, covered them in ice-cold water. Now, being a monkey, it's not a nice thing to have ice-cold water thrown all over you. So, they, uh, they got to a point where every time a monkey would go up the step ladders, they knew they would get the water coming down on them. So the other monkeys would stop him and say, look, don't go up there. You eat the bananas, I'm going to get wet. So it got to a point where after no time, the monkeys just sat there, the bananas sat on top, and they just ignored them. The scientist, being the scientist, replaced one of the monkeys with a new monkey. And he came in and said, hey, cool, free bananas. So he heads up the step ladder, but the four monkeys jump on him. So you don't go up there, we're going to get wet. Stop. So he tries it again, and they jump on him, and gets to a point where he says, you know what? I'm not going to bother getting those bananas. Pointless. I'm going to get jumped on. So a week later, scientists replace another monkey. He walks in. Ah, cool, free bananas. So he heads up the step ladder. Now, he gets jumped on by the four monkeys in there. But one of those monkeys is a new monkey. He's never got wet, but he's still jumping on them to stop it. I think you might be able to see what's going to happen here. A week later, the scientists replace another monkey, and he heads up the step ladders. Excellent, free bananas. But no, he's jumped on by the others to stop him. They don't want to get, well, the two old ones don't want to get wet. The two new ones are thinking, I don't know, we have to stop him. He's not allowed to get those bananas. So after a period of time, all of the old monkeys, oh, sorry, all of the, uh, the original monkeys are replaced, and we've got five monkeys sitting there. You know, any time that any of them try and go up, the others jump on him and stop them. And we end up with five completely new monkeys. None of them have got wet, and they're ignoring this bunch of lovely, fresh, juicy bananas that are sitting on top of a step ladder. Now, monkeys don't talk. I think we all know that. But hypothetically, if you could ask them, why don't you go and get those bananas? They will probably say to you, it's the way it's always been. We're in here. It's just the way it's done. I think the, the message from this story is that you should not do things just because that's the way it's always been done. Don't build another data center because that's the way it's always been done. Innovation requires change. And I think either you do it or one of your competitors is going to go and do it for you and you will lose your competitive advantage. Kempinski, we try and innovate, we try and pioneer, we try and lead. We're very much behind Amazon. We found it to be a success, and we know that some of our competitors are now following us. Don't do things the way they've always been done. Or, to put it another way, go out there and grab those bananas. Thank you. Great, thank you. I want to go work for a luxury hotel brand. At least you get your monkeys with it. Uh, no, it's great actually to see how um, we've seen two younger businesses actually be able to build from the ground up. Or if you look at Saxon Wunderkinder, they started off more traditionally, moved over to a new resource model. Look from Steve from Morgan, how we've helped them. But also, those are younger businesses actually. But if you look at Kapinski, which is a 100-year-old business, oh, it's, it's amazing how 
uh, we can also help them transform the way that they do IT so they can put their resources against what really matters um, instead of uh, you know, doing the no un undifferentiating heavy lifting. Th there's always been talk a bit about that there are certain sort of verticals that cannot you make use of AWS. Um, and, and to be honest, I've never seen any of them. Yeah, so, for example, financial services is one where, um, where we've seen you know, equally uh, sort of stress uh, these days in terms of, you know, there's extreme competition, uh, and there's a desire to bring new products into the market very rapidly, um, often with the internet channel as being the sort of the first channel to deliver new products to customers. Um, and they're really interested in doing you know, a, lot of, a lot of rapid experimentation. Now, on one end, the financial services were actually some of our earliest enterprises that are making use of our cloud. But that was more in the area of sort of risk analysis, you know, sort of the HPC style that you, that you can do. Um, and many of them were actually very interested in being able to experiment, for example, at night with you know, whether they would use 2,000 cores or 4,000 cores to do their calculations, to figure out, you know, to gain an edge when the market would open in, in the morning. Um, and they really had to have built very great systems uh, around that. But there's also more uh, sort of more traditional financial services uh, being run on top of the AWS platform. Um, now, of course, there's one thing that, that comes with financial systems. It is very strict regulatory compliance uh, re requirements. Um, and, but what we've seen, for example, is that some of our partners have seen this as an edge, yeah, as a niche where they can actually go into. So the NASDAQ, the OMX group, has launched something that is called FinCloud that actually helps other financial institutions with meeting their uh, obligations around reporting um, and document storage and things like that, or electronic document storage, um, in a way that it exactly meets uh, the requirements of the regulators. And they're very, very successful with it. But if you look here at Europe, uh, for example, in the Netherlands, uh, Robeco is moving over their retail banking onto AWS um, with approval of the Dutch Central Bank. So uh, they make use of a platform built by a partner called Open, um, and they're moving very fast. Well, Open has a, um, a package that's called a bank in a box that you can launch on top of AWS, and it meets the full support of the regulator. So another area, sort of the last one that I want to touch on, is, uh, that is the world of energy. And so, um, there we've seen, there is a very, there's a very interesting world actually. So the world of energy, um, the, these organizations are very big long organizations that move traditional rather slow. Uh, and why? Because there's never been that much dynamicism in their organization. But what we see here is that they're actually being put under pressure by newer, younger companies. If you look at companies like Nest, who built their, they've built this uh, very intelligent um, thermostat that runs completely on AWS in terms of the, their data and analytics. Um, and so if we look at uh, a company like a traditional energy company like Ascent, who is part of the uh, RWE um, concern here in Germany, um, you know, they make use of our platform to build all sorts of new tools for their consumers to be able to control, um, to control the energy in their house while they are away. So all these all phones on smartphones are enabled by actually so, uh, both checking, um, looking at your energy consumption at home, uh, and, but also controlling it. Um, Shell became a, uh, a very large, of a substantial customer of ours by moving large parts of their IT organization over to us to support uh, agility. So if you look at a company like Shell, who's been a very traditional IT company, for them the challenge was that they wanted to, um, they wanted to move faster, they wanted to support innovation in their world, but often IT organization was seen as a blocker. So to, be, to actually be able to make use of new resource models, they were able to move much faster than that they were in the, in the past. So I hope that I've given you a few um, sort of few insights in how 
cloud computing is making, is changing the way large corporations, but also small businesses, are, are changing t today. So, so let's take a look at uh, sort of the few things that I think is, is going to happen next. But I'm not going to talk about new services that AWS is going to deliver or anything like that. But let me s talk a bit about a few drivers that I see um, driving substantial change. And it's not that I have a crystal ball, so I'm not going to look five years ahead. I'm going to look at what is actually happening today and what are the changes that we see happening today. So, so a, a, a first day of a baby's life, yeah, 70 times the content of the Library of Congress is being captured in digital form. Yeah, and that's only the beginning. Yeah, so the amount of digital content is truly exploding. Yeah, and that's only on the consumer side. Yeah, but for many of our companies, we are already in sort of the age of big data, where we use data analytics to better understand our customers. Yeah, and remember that in this new world, in the new world of extreme competition with abundance of products and you know, reducing consumer loyalty, you need to know what your customers are doing with your products. And so if I look at the um, sort of big data revolution that is happening, um, it's all about finding a competitive edge as a business. For that, you need to understand your customer. Yeah, so who is your customer? What, what do they like? How are they using your products? Yeah, that, that is the crux of much of the uh, uh, data analytics that is happening today. And if we look at the coming year, these are sort of four things that I think will be happening uh, around the whole big data movement. Yeah, it will become more and more real time meaning that you will build, be building pipelines in AWS where this data is flowing through, and you'll create um, feedback loops directly into your applications to be able to target your customers better. Yeah, and there will be a much deeper integration with cloud computing, because to be able to move faster, you will need more resources. Yeah, and big data is not just about doing analytics. It's actually a whole pipeline. How to collect your data, how to store it, how to organize it, how to analyze it, and how to share it. Yeah? Each of these five steps are actually things that you need to take care of if you want to build a big data organization. Yeah? And so each of those map really well onto the facilities that cloud computing gives you. So we'll see a deeper integration of that in the coming years to come. I also think that we will be seeing many more vertical applications. It turns out that it is actually relatively hard to write good algorithms to analyze this data to get exactly the answers that you want. So you'll, you'll see more and more applications that do, for example, micro segmentation of your customer set, yeah, so that you can better target your customers. And in all of this, yeah, this sort of default execution engine that we've been using for these big data projects, Hadoop, or as, we, as you also might know, is MapReduce, and, and AWS actually has a service called Elastic Map Produce that makes it really easy to execute these things, will actually drop much lower. We will see platforms being built on this that are more analytics-oriented. Because in essence, Hadoop is not an analytics engine. It is a distributed execution environment that makes it really easy to execute these big data problems at scale, but you still need to write the analytics um, to actually make use of it. So we will see platforms arising on top of this that will actually maybe even make Hadoop invisible. It's just a lower layer in the whole execution environment. And I think actually if you look at something that is uh, relatively new in, in AWS as well, is uh, Amazon Redshift, which is our data warehouse service that we launched uh, at the end of last year. And Redshift is, uh, is rather spectacular. Yeah? Uh, with less than $1,000 per terabyte per year, you can get blindingly fast analytics. And many of the people that have been using uh, Redshift all rave about uh, how fast the service is. Yeah, that you can easily load uh, millions and millions of rows, uh, rows into uh, Redshift very rapidly and then execute your queries, at uh, pretty complex queries, at less than a second. Good thing is, that Redshift is available in the EU 
um, starting actually, um, was it last week? Uh, and so you can actually go into the AWS console and immediately start up a, a Redshift instance if you want to get access to this very, very fast data analytics engine. So I think both Redshift and Glacier are two examples that we've uh, launched recently that are really focused on how our customers in larger enterprises are, are struggling with uh, so the growth of, uh, of digital data. So on one hand, uh, the data warehouses, where the growth of digital information requires you to do more and more analytics and build bigger data warehouses that are just incredibly expensive. Yeah, the, the, these, the traditional data warehouses are so expensive, while performance is really hard to achieve there. And so Redshift addresses that. The other part in the rise of digital information is actually um, the way that you do archiving. And so many of the larger companies will be using these very massive tape libraries. And these ta massive tape libraries are, again, very expensive, yet it is not a differentiating factor in your business. I've seen quite a few enterprises that have to move to a second tape library or a third tape library just to be able to continue to control the amount of digital information that is being produced in their enterprise. So we launched Amazon Glacier and uh, with Glacier, you can actually, for one cent a gigabyte a year, you can actually archive your data. This makes that whole organizations can now start getting rid of their, both their tape environments as well as their data warehousing environments, and actually have some of the best people in your organization work on things that really matter for your customers instead of just these infrastructure pieces. I think another uh, area where we will see uh, a tremendous uh, drive of new data is that of connected devices. Uh, I mentioned Shell earlier. So Shell wants to insert new types of sensors into uh, many of their exploration environments, and each one of those sensors can generate petabytes of data. Not only that, they want to actually deploy 10,000 of them. You can imagine with those kind of data streams that are being uh, generated and the amount of computation you need to do on top of that, you need to have a very flexible resource environment. Um, another thing that I think in this world of connected devices, what will happen is that, uh, and we already seeing that is this moment, that content and devices will become independent. Where you... Um, We've all been using your laptops, or uh, you've been using your tablets and your mobile devices and things like that. Uh, in the past, you would load content on there if you want to watch it or listen to it or read it. These days, these devices are just a window into the cloud where your content is living. It also allows many more devices to become sort of internet enabled. We really made, uh, for example, um, uh, Ford Cars has now integrated the Amazon Cloud Player into it, so you can get access to, your, to all of your music while you're driving your car without that you actually have to start connecting devices and things like that. Yeah, and what I want is actually in the morning when I step on the treadmill in the hotel, yeah, I do that sometimes, yeah, uh, I actually want the treadmill to immediately reconfigure itself for me. I want to identify myself, and then I want the treadmill to have my my movies, my subscriptions, my books, my, maybe my business documents, uh, my music, all these things need to be available there. And this is what's going to happen, very, uh, it's already happening now. If you look at the Kindle environment, for example, you can read your book while you lay on the couch, you step in the car and you let the Kindle read to you, and then you go on to, you're standing in the checkout line in the, in the store, and you pull out your phone and you continue to read where you were, where you had left off. So these devices, are becoming independent of their content. It also means that you can upgrade these devices or buy new devices anytime that you want, but you, they will just access the same data in the cloud. And whether it's data or content that you've, that you've um, you know, acquired from Amazon or from other uh, e-commerce companies, or whether this is data that, for example, companies like Sex Wunderkinder have um, uh, put into the cloud so that you can use any of your applications, whether it's on the desktop, whether it's on mobile, or whether it's on your tablet device. Another area where I think uh, we'll see uh, tremendous change in the coming year is that of security and privacy. Yeah, and, and I won't spend that much time on it, um, 
because uh, Stephen Schmidt will be uh, talking after me. Uh, he's uh, the Amazon Chief Information Security Officer. He'll be really going into detail uh, in all the security options that are there in AWS. Um, but I think one of the things that you will be seeing is a tremendous rise in encryption techniques. The way to handle yeah, storing um, sensitive business data or personal identifiable information, for example, yeah, on our cloud is, or, in cl or actually on your own premises as well, is to encrypt that data. And so Steve will be talking about key management and things like that that will be happening there. And we will continue to actually expand our security options in this world. And Steve will be going into detail there. So I want to uh, come back to this point. Yeah, it's really important for us to, uh, to help us pursue your dreams, to be able to build things uh, that you've never been able to build, to make it easier, to actually help you focus on your customer. Um, you know, and I hope that uh, you guys today will get a lot of information about how that's actually possible. Steve will be talking about security, but after that, in the breakout sessions, you'll be able to go really deep on all the different technologies that are out there. With that, I thank you, and uh, have a great day.